Okay, instead of introducing a lot of new physics topics this time around, I think I'm going to just do some more problems that builds our confidence with using Coulomb's law, as well as reminds ourselves of some of the kind of strategies that we might employ when solving, say, Newton's second law problems. So, let's remind ourselves of Coulomb's law, or the electrostatic force, between two charges, I'll be very explicit where I say kind of on one from two. So there might be some charge here, there's some charge Q1, some charge here, there's some charge Q2. Based on some coordinate system which I lay down, in which case then this is a vector called R1 that points to charge 1. This is a vector R2 that points to R2. And this is a vector R that points from Q or to Q1 from Q2, which we said before was 2 from. When that comes first is the 2, 1 after the minus sign is the from. And so this electrostatic force then can be written as there's an overall magnitude which might have a sign change depending on Q1 or Q2. If we care about the signs of Q1 and Q2 that gets all the vector directions right. And it's divided by the magnitude of that R vector squared. And then this is all being multiplied by the unit vector, r. Or again, r is a unit vector, so it's the same thing as the original vector r, divided by its magnitude. It points to q1 from q2. And if both charges are positive, both charges are negative, then that also ends up being the direction that the force points in. If there's an opposite charge, one is positive, one's negative, then the entire force vector points in the opposite direction of r hat. So, we worked through some problems last time where we were very explicit about calculating all these steps. Once we get some confidence in doing that, we might not have to do all those steps explicitly, but again, we should practice doing it so we can feel okay about what we're doing. So suppose I have a mass that hangs from a string and it has an overall charge, Q. And then above the ground is another charge, which has a charge, negative Q. Same but opposite sign. They are separated a distance L. And the question is, if we are near the surface of the Earth, what Q is needed so that this hovering charge, this negative Q, so the negative Q charge can hover stationary in the air. That is the pull up from the electrostatic force counteracts perfectly the downward gravitational pull. And let's let this negative charge have also a mass m. Now typically in a problem there might be numbers associated with these with these symbols, but I also want us to get in the habit of working in symbols more or less 99% of the time, plugging in numbers only at the absolute very end. So I'm not even going to give you numbers to start off with. We're going to work entirely with symbols, because I can really manipulate symbols easier algebraically than if I'm juggling around numbers and 
rounding every time I, you know, multiply or divide by a number and way more opportunity for mistakes. Let's take this as an opportunity to think about applying Newton's laws of motion. First, conceptually, the idea by stationary, stationary is an example of constant velocity. Namely, it's a constant velocity of zero uh, if it's going to be stationary. Newton's second law states that the sum of all the vector forces on an object then is equal to the mass of that object times the object's resulting acceleration. And again, if we want to be explicit, these are forces acting on the object. An object can't act on itself. And this is the mass and acceleration of the object. Forces act on the object, and as a result, that object then experiences an acceleration. The magnitude of that acceleration depends on its overall mass. That's why we call this the inertial mass. The more massive object, it's harder to get moving. I apply the same force, I apply the same kick to a tennis ball compared to a bowling ball. The tennis ball goes flying, the bowling ball really doesn't go anywhere. Same force, but much lower acceleration. Either of them will start rolling or sliding on ice, the tennis ball moves much, has a much larger acceleration, ends up having a much larger velocity once it loses contact with your foot. So, stationary, or kind of statics problems, where V is a constant, which particularly is zero in this case, implies that the derivative of velocity, which is by definition acceleration, better be zero. Derivative of a constant is zero. What is the slope of a constant line? Zero. So statics problems require that there is no net force. The sum of the forces better add up to zero in this case. I'm emphasizing constant velocity because that's what Newton's laws are saying. I can have a constant, or I could have a net force of zero and be moving still, of course, but I'd be moving at a constant velocity. So don't get it in the misconception that if the sum of the forces equals zero, that implies it's stationary. It's stationary implies there is no net force. But you can also, but that's but the um, converse is not true, always true. You can have a net force of zero, but not have velocity be zero. So let me recopy or redraw. So we have negative QM, positive Q. So what are the steps of doing a Newton law problem? All right, first we identify the system. What are we actually studying? It could be a single object, it could be multiple objects, it can be whatever you want. You have to correctly identify, you have to appropriately identify the system. So I usually box it in with some sort of dash box or something like that. That is what I'm studying, that's my system. I'm gonna study that hovering charge that has some mass as well. Once I identify the system, I identify all contact forces. Anything that touches your red box must exert a force on your system. In this case, there is nothing touching the box. So, in this case, no contact forces. So 
three, identify all long range forces. In this case, there are two. There's F sub G from gravity, and then there's F sub, maybe we'll call it F sub E for Coulomb or electrostatic. So we now know that, so then Newton's second law then must imply that F sub G plus F sub E as vectors are equal zero. Now you might be saying, wait, shouldn't F sub G have a minus sign? Well, not at this step. Newton's law says the sum of the forces as vectors equals mass times acceleration. There are no minus signs in that expression. You have to introduce the minus signs based on either your coordinate system or because there is a minus sign in the actual formula. For example, uh, you know, Hooke's law, right? It's usually written in something like negative kx, though that itself actually is um, a result of a coordinate system choice. Um, what's a better example? That's not a good example. Uh, drag is a good example. Uh, drag usually is pointing in the opposite direction of velocity. So the drag force, I just write off to the side, right, the drag force is usually written as like negative some constant times the velocity. This negative then says that it points in the opposite direction of the velocity vector. So if you're moving to the right, drag points to the left. If you're moving to the left, drag points to the right. That minus sign has kind of physical meaning. There's also minus signs that originate because of your coordinate system, which again, you are free to decide upon. Right, so I might call that step four, right? Right, establish a coordinate system um, and identify maybe the components of all of the forces. In that case, let me redraw the picture once again. Oops, I'm giving away the punchline there. I have hanging mass. This is essentially a 1D problem. So we can write it out explicitly as a 2D problem. You are free to establish a coordinate system to be whatever you want. You can put the origin wherever you want. Maybe I'll put the or maybe I'll draw my origin, my axes like this. So I've established that my origin is here. Again, that's my choice. Then the charges look like they're some distance to the right in the x direction. That ultimately will not matter. Um, and then there's some height above the origin in the y direction. I could have decided to instead, and maybe we'll do this, since this is essentially a 1D problem, I'll just set my coordinate axis to be with the vertical axis right along where the two charges are. So then the origin, and then maybe I'll put the origin at the ground. So I'll put the origin at the same place where the ground is. So then my origin is here. And it looks like then, given this coordinate system, I can establish, for one, the position of R negative Q. And then this would be R positive Q. And I can also say something about, for example, the gravitational force. The gravitational force only points in the Y direction. And here I can establish that I must make it negative mg, and then in the y direction since this is a vector. 
Now here the negative is a result of my coordinate system choice. Why? Because when I drew the coordinate system like this, I established that up was positive and to the right was positive. Now again, there's a right hand rule motivations for why we do that, but I could have made down positive. I could have made left positive. Right? You are again free to do that if you want. But then if I were to example make down positive, I would want the gravitational force to be plus mg because I know that the force should make the object accelerate towards the ground. If I make up positive, the gravitational force better be negative mg. That minus sign tells me the force will pull the object down. So in that case, that's the result of my coordinate system choice. And then you might say that the electrostatic force, if we do it without really being nitpicky like we did in the last lecture, you might identify that on my system, that negative Q charge should be pulled up. So it should be K Q squared over the distance between them, which we said was L. And then that's all positive numbers. And then it's in the plus y direction, right? By kind of intuition, kind of conceptual understanding. For 1D problems, usually you can do that. For multi-dimensional problems, you might want to be careful and go through all the steps like we did last time. So in this case, then, step five, I guess, would be all right, solve. So Newton's law said that the sum of the forces acting on my system better add up to zero. That then implied that the gravitational force as a vector plus the electrostatic force as a vector added up to zero. Nothing I've said so far it depends on the, my coordinate system at all. Now I will bring in the coordinate system, which we said this was negative mg in the y direction plus k q squared over l squared in the y direction, and that better equal zero as a vector, or zero in the x direction plus zero in the y direction. The x direction kind of becomes kind of unnecessary. There's nothing really to say in the x direction. So then we can just focus on the y direction. So that looks like in the y direction, negative mg plus k q squared over l squared. Better add up to the component in the y direction, which we said was zero. Or looks like q better equal to positive mg l squared over k, all in the square root, or simplifying mg over k in the square root, all times l. And again, notice I did this without a single number, right? Because I feel like with symbols, I can still remember kind of like what these variables correspond to, masses, gravities, lengths. I can then quickly do some dimensional analysis, or I should make sure the units make sense. This indeed does have units of coulombs at the end of the day. And then, if the problem were to provide numbers, that's when I could I could plug in some numbers, right? So if it said, for example, that L, not a highlighter, please. If L is say a nanometer, which then I'll convert to MKS so that I don't make a mistake plugging in the wrong number. If, well, G, if we're near the surface of the Earth, we know that's 9.81 meters per second squared. If the mass, for example, maybe is a microgram, which is 10 to the minus 6 grams, 
which is 10 to the minus 9 kilograms. Let's see, and then we had Coulomb's constant of 8.99 times 10 to the 9 uh, with some fancy mixed unit. Let's see, we had it would be uh, Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Then we could plug in some numbers uh, and we should be able to get an answer. Um, all of these are in MKS. So if we were to um, bring up our Desmos or Google, can be a good enough calculator in a pinch. Now we can, we can see here. All right, so let's see. Uh, we have square root of uh, m, which we said was one e to the negative nine times g nine point eight one. If I know every every number is an MKS, then I can not deal with entering the units. Eight point nine nine times ten to the negative nine. Let's see, and that's everything in the square root times ten to the negative nine. Uh, so we did one nanometer, and it looks like I get that Q is about 1.04 times 10 to the negative 18 coulombs. How many charges is, is that? Well, the number of charges then would be Q divided by the fundamental charge unit. So then we could take this entire beast, divide by 1.602 e to the negative 19, about six and a half. Of course, I made these numbers on, off the top of my head. Really, we know that this number should be some some integer unit, right? So that's just me making stuff up. I could have came up with some numbers maybe before I started recording. Whoops, doesn't matter. Though the takeaway here, perhaps, is we should identify that it's really not a lot, right? Again, you got the whole Earth pulling down on this thing. We only need each each of those charges to have, you know, roughly six to seven extra thi extra, you know, charge, you know, you know, ch fundamental charges, e's or minus e's, uh, and you can win against gravity. Pretty impressive. All right. So I'll leave it to you that you might want to try, if you wanted to try writing down, we wrote down Coulomb's law there kind of based on our intuition of what direction it should point. Uh, you might try kind of going through the steps uh, like we did last time and like what we will do right now for this second problem. Let's see. So we are going to have an equilateral triangle, which I will draw to the best of my ability. The side of each triangle, we'll just say is length L, and each vertex has a charge Q. And the question is, is what is F net on the top charge? And I would like this as a vector. Now, if I think of this, let's think through. So the lower left, or we'll call, let's call this QL, and this is gonna be QR that we're going to study kind of what they're doing on the charge at the very top. Well, I know Q sub L should, if they're both the same charge, Q, let's just pretend it's positive, right? They could both be negative, but could be both be positive. I know in either case, 
the force vector is going to look something like this. So that's going to be kind of force on Q um, from QL. And then from Q right, I expect something like this. So that's going to be the force on Q from QR. And what do I expect them, those two vectors, to be when I add them up? Now, you might be thinking it should point straight up. Well, we know how to do vector addition, right? So I could take, I could take the Q sub R vector, I could make a copy of it here. And then by vector addition, or I think it's called what, the parallelogram rule or something, you know, the sum of this vector plus this vector then looks like it's something that's going to look like that. Okay, so looks like Q net may point straight up. Now we want to practice and we want to get better at our, our intuition about these things that when we look at a problem like this, we should know immediately that F net is going to point straight up based on, again, the symmetry of the problem. If all of the charges have the same Q, then those two red vectors that, I, that I've drawn here and here must be the same length, right? Because this charge is a length L away, Q and Q, and then this charge is a length L away from charge Q and Q. So by symmetry, these arrows better be identical in length. Now, obviously pointing in different directions. And by the symmetry, when they add up together, it looks like it should be a purely vertical vector. So we should expect a vertical vector. symmetry. Let's actually now go through this and convince ourselves that is indeed the case. The math will not lie. Math never lies. All right, so what do we have to do? We need to establish a coordinate system. So that drawing is getting messy, so let me redraw. Where to put my coordinate system? What's my system? I guess my system, I'm studying this charge. So I am, I am studying the forces that are acting on that charge. Um, or at least we're focusing here on just the electrostatic forces. Yeah, I guess we could, we could say that they're separated by length L um, but maybe there's not actual rods, uh, so we don't have to worry about any sort of contact force. So, in that case, um, my, I've identified my system. I know there are no contact forces, but there are going to be two long-range forces, those from the electrostatic forces. And now I'm going to establish my coordinate system. I'll make it blue. Why not just put my coordinate system at the charge of interest? So let's just put the coordinate system there. So the origin is at where that charge Q is. I guess this is Q. This is also this is what we call Q sub R, which also has a charge Q. And this is what we're calling Q sub L, which also has a charge Q. So then the position vector for Q, or the one on the top, is just zero, right? We placed it at the origin. Now can I write down the position vector for, say, um, maybe I'll use the column vector notation this time. All right, so it's zero, zero in this 2D problem. What about Q sub L, that, that left charge? Well, based on my coordinate system, it seems like it's going to have a negative x value and a negative y value. Now, can I figure out what those are? Well, of course I can. 
because we have a beautiful triangle that's right in front of our eyes. Right? It looks like this triangle is the key triangle to use. There's a right angle here, so I've got a nice Sokotoa thing going on for me. And the fact that it's an equilateral triangle tells me what, for example, this angle is. An equilateral triangle means that all three of these angles are 60 degrees, so then this better just be 30 degrees. So it looks like my triangle of interest, or the triangle I care about, is something like this. Here's theta. Uh, theta, I said, is 30 degrees. Great, one of the ones I have memorized in terms of the trig functions, or at least I had to in high school. I know this is length L, because I know the Q's are separated by length L. And based on the drawing, it looks like this is uh, the y component. This this is the y component, and then this is the x component. If I can figure out those lengths, and I know it's in the quadrant where they should both be negative, then I've done it. Well, then of course that's of course easy. Sokotoa my way. The swoosh always touches the hypotenuse and the adjacent side. So cosine of 30 degrees is adjacent over hypotenuse. So it looks like that is the y coordinate divided by the hypotenuse. Or that the length of that, tri of that side of the triangle is L root 3 over 2. And then I will add in the negative sign uh, but you know, lengths of triangles are always positive, but I know this is in the qu quadrant where it should be a negative sign. Similarly, sine of 30 degrees is going to be opposite over hypotenuse. So then it looks like the length of the x, of what I call the x component of, that, of the triangle, is L over half. So then the position vector in this case looks like it's negative L over 2, then negative root 3 L over 2. I'll let you figure out the right side. It is plus L over 2, and then still negative root 3 L over 2. Again, look for triangles. So now I have position vectors. I have each of these position vectors points to a particular charge. So then if I want to do force on Q from Q sub L, that then is K, Q, Q sub L over the length of the vector pointing to Q from Q sub L squared times the unit vector where the unit vector points 2q from q sub l. So we've already done that r in this case points 2q from q sub l, which looks like in that case is just l over 2 root 3l over 2. The magnitude of this vector looks like then it's the square root of l over 2 squared plus root 3 L over 2 squared. And what does that become? Square root of L squared over 4 plus 3 L squared over 4. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this looks like it's just L, square root of L squared or L. Of course, it's a vector that points from Q sub L to Q. That's how the triangle we said had length L. So then I could say that the magnitude of that vector squared is then just L squared. That gives me the denominator. The unit vector is then my, the original vector divided by the magnitude. So it looks, the magnitude we said was L, and then that's being divided by both components of R, L over two, positive root three L over two. So it looks like then the unit vector looks like all the L's cancel 
1 half root 3 over 2. Again, you could convince yourself that the magnitude of the unit vector is indeed 1. That better be the case. And it's pointing in the same direction, right? It could ask you to find the angle it makes with the positive x-axis. It better be the same exact angle that the original vector made. And so now it looks like we are all set. So then the force on Q from Q sub L is K, Q, Q sub L. The magnitude squared, we said the magnitude was L, so that's just L squared, multiplied by the vector pointing to Q from Q sub L, which we have as 1 half root 3 over 2. Q sub L is just Q, so then this looks like and I can pull out a one half, it looks like, so it's k, q squared over 2, l squared. And the vector here looks like there's a 1, and then this is a root 3. Some vector that looks like it points as a component that points to the right, and then a point, component that points up, that's a vector that points kind of in this direction, which makes sense. I'll let you try the other one. Again, go through all the steps. Some of the steps will give you the same exact answers, some will not. So force on Q from Q sub R, you should get at the end of the day, K Q squared over two L squared, well then the components are negative one root three. which looks like a vector that points up and to the left, or this way, as we would expect. So then we put it all together. Then it looks like F net, which is the sum of the two. It looks like there's a K Q squared over two L squared for both. And it looks like it's the sum of the vectors one root three plus the vector negative one root three Note, the ones cancel. Ah, exactly what we wanted. So k q squared over 2 l squared looks like then becomes 0, 2 root 3. The twos cancel. And it looks like at the end of the day, f net is k q squared over l squared, a vector that does not point in the horizontal direction has root 3 in the vertical direction. Or if I wanted to write it without uh, I might just put y hat, something like that. Something that points vertically upward. Kind of what we would expect. Um, again based on the symmetry of the problem. Now for the other two charges the symmetry of the problem, again, tells us the direction that the vector should point, right? F net for this lower left should point something like this, and F net for this one should point something like that. Um, that will have horizontal and vertical components based on the coordinate system that I've plopped down. Um, <clears throat> but again, by the symmetry, we kind of can already, we can anticipate the direction it should point. All right, anything else I want to say about that problem? No. Okay. What about this one? Suppose you throw down a coordinate system that has the Earth at the origin And then the moon is on the horizontal axis that you've thrown down a distance d away, where d is the distance kind of measured from the centers of the objects. All right, so let's make the coordinate system blue.
mass of the Earth. It's kind of the astronomical symbol for Earth, a circle with a plus sign in it. Uh, is about 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. The moon, actually, don't remember the symbol for the moon. So let's use an M. It's about 100 times less, so about 7 times 10 to the 22 kilograms. I'm not even going to tell you the distance because it turns out we don't even need to know the distance for the problem we're about to do. If you want to know, it's about a quarter of a million miles. So the question then is. Um, what equal charges Q should be on both objects to cancel out the inward gravitational force. So gravity is of course pulling those things together. If they each had the same amount of charge, which again could be positive or negative, then there would be an equal and opposite force repel repelling both. And the question then is, what should that charge be in order to cancel out the gravitational force? Again, let's do this without all the messy vector machinery, but I leave it to you to try to do this again with all the ve messy vector machinery um, since uh, to convince yourself that that still works even in 1D problems. That's good practice. But Let's pick an object to study. Here we go, let's study the moon. If I'm gonna study the moon, I know there are two long range forces on the moon. There's a gravitational force and this electrostatic force that we're adding on. All right, to cancel out implies the sum of the two vectors better add up to zero. Again, you might think there, I'm missing a minus sign. No. The minus signs will come into right into the expressions we have for the vectors. The idea that two vectors cancel each other out means that I add the two vectors together and they add up to the zero vector. Which then means that when I if I were to draw them, if one vector points this way and has that length, the other vector better point the opposite direction and have um, the same length. Such that when I add them together. I end up back where I started. All right, so this also is a good reminder of Newton's universal law of gravity and these things called the shell theorems. Um, so Newton's law of gra of universal gravitation in this case was something like g m1 m2 over R squared. And then, if, and then well, I guess we have to be careful depending on how we define R. Um, so is, is this a force on M1 from M2? It should be explicit. Uh, so let me move this over. So if this is the force of gravity on M1 from M2, and I want to call it that, I could either define, de, I need to debate whether or not there's a minus sign out front, uh, but that ultimately comes down to what I define as my vector r. So if I define r in the same way we did it for Coulomb's laws, to not be confusing, as it points to m1 
from M2. Then we need an overall minus sign out front, if that's the definition we're going to use. You know, take M1 to be the Earth and M2 to be the Moon. Uh, if M1 is the Earth and M2 is the Moon, then the R vector points to the left. But the Earth is being pulled towards the Moon, so, that vector, so the, the 4 should point to the right. So we need that minus sign overall. Draw it out for yourself uh, to convince yourself. So if we want to be, if we want to have both of these inverse square laws use you know, as many of the same definitions as possible, else we lose our minds. Uh, let's call R, or if it's on M1 from M2, then let's have R point from M to M1 from M2. But then we need the minus sign because gravity is always attractive. So um, we had these things called the shell theorems. Really, I only need to remind myself of one of them right now. So I'll just say shell theorem. Geometrically derived by Newton, can do it with some uh, not too bad integrals that you could do after a Calc 2 type course. Uh, so for gravity, it says that a spherically uniform distribution of mass. exerts the same gravitational force on other objects as if instead of it being the spherical distribution that has volume right it's the same thing as if you imagined it as a point particle located at the center Right, so exerts the same gravitational force on other objects as if it were of a point particle at the center of the sphere. Again, an argument relying on symmetry. So, and that kind of also motivates why we're talking about from the centers of objects. So if the Earth and the Moon are kind of uniformly uh, or spherically symmetric distributions of mass, which to a decent approximation they are, we can replace this entire sphere of the Earth with just a point particle that has the entire mass of the Earth located at that, at that point. Then we can take the moon and replace it with a point particle that had the entire mass of the moon at that center point. And then when we are considering distances, we're looking at the distances between these two point particles. In an upper level analytic mechanics class, you can often do this even with more funky distributions, uh, but the, low, the point that you use is not necessarily the center, but it's what's called the center of mass. I'll leave that for sophomore year. So what we can do now is ask ourselves, does the shell theorem also apply to the Coulomb force? Coulomb force is exactly the same form. It's an inverse square law you know, that kind of points from center to center. So the shell theorem also applies to uniform distributions of charge. If we take the moon and the earth to be conductors, the charge is gonna to want to spread itself you know, all that charge is going to want to get as far away from its, from, from, or if I have a bunch of charges on the Earth, for example, they're all going to want to get as far away from each other as possible. As a result, they kind of uniformly spread out uh, all around the Earth. 
uh, so it forms a nearly uniform distribution. Similarly for the moon. So in this case, then, we can also well approximate them as uh, when conducting the electrostatic force, think of them as just point charges. That greatly simplifies my life, because now I essentially have my coordinate system where I have now a point particle here, M Earth. I have a point particle here called M Moon. It is a distance d away. So the position vector of the Earth is zero. Position vector of the Moon looks like it is kind of d. We want to think of it as a 2D vector, but this really is a 1D problem. Might write it like that. If I'm studying the moon, right, then R should point to the moon from the Earth. And since the Earth is at the origin, looks like this is just t comma zero. The magnitude of that vector is just d. The unit vector then is I divide both by d. D divided by d is one. Zero divided by d is zero. It is just a vector that points to the right, right? The unit vector that points to the right. We usually call this something like you know, x hat or something like that. So, and these are used, again, since we try to define the gravitational force analogously, um, that r in the gravitational force is, is going to be the same r we just calculated here. This magnitude, of course, is the same magnitude there. So then it looks like the gravitational force plus the electrostatic force, which you want to add up to zero, looks like it's negative g, m earth, m moon. I guess I stopped using the symbol for the earth. Oh, that's okay. Uh, over the length of that vector, which was d, but then we square it. And then we multiply it by r hat, uh, which we I'll just write it as a column vector, right? One comma zero. And then we add to it k q times q q squared for the length um, or the distance d squared multiplied by r hat, which we said is the same thing as x hat. And this better be zero. Again, the y components is kind of a meaningless equation. So if I look at just the x components, looks like I have negative g, m earth, m moon, over d squared, plus k q squared over d squared equals zero. Notice that, as I saw for q, the d's cancel. What a treat. So then Q looks like it's the square root of G, M Earth, M Moon, all over Coulomb's constant K. Really, when I took the square root, right, it would give plus or minus, which makes sense, right? Because they, they both can have a positive charge. They both could have a negative charge, right? Both would result in a repulsion. And this is the Q that would then get rid of gravity, or at least balance out gravity. Gravity doesn't go away. I shouldn't say that. Uh, assuming I didn't make a mistake when I plugged in some numbers right in my notebook, I got something like 5.6 times 10 to the 13 coulombs or something like that when I plugged in some numbers. So in that case, right, you need a lot more charge, but here we're pushing back, you know, whole plant, a planet and a moon from each other compared to that first problem we did. But again, notice how, again, we're kind of very systematically setting all these things up and um, applying them as we apply them to Newton's laws, right? We could also try a problem like, all right, go back to that first problem. Right, you had the negative q 
uh, and this was positive Q, and we said this had a mass M. Suppose I said this also had a mass M. Uh, actually, let's make it, let's have it a mass uh, M over 3. All right, so it has less mass. Um, then I could ask, what is the, actually, no, let's uh, do it the other way. Apologies. I suppose it has 10 M as its, as ma as its mass. We figured out the Q such that the negative, such that the hovering charge hovers in the air. But I could ask, for example, um, uh, what is the tension in the you know, rod or rope or whatever it is? Holding up the other charge. In this case, I'll let you think of this. I'll probably put it on uh, our class sheet. Right? In this case, there is a contact force, right, F rod. But then there's also the gravitational force. That's a long range force. And there's also the electrostatic force. That's a long range force. So it seems like I have three forces that are adding up. And I guess I should be very explicit. Um, you know, assume uh, it's also remains stationary. If it's also stationary, that means, right, that it's not just two forces balancing each other out, but there are now three forces that are balancing each other out. Um, but that then requires a tension force to kind of come into play. And the tension force Right, this is as a result of some sort of tension. Tension is what some books call kind of passive forces. And that what they mean by that is that they're the, they're the type of forces that can adjust themselves to ensure some sort of equilibrium. Uh, they, you know, the tension force can change to ensure that this uh, ball of charge does not move. Just like how I, you know, I always say like, the normal force, which I hate that name, uh, the normal force, which is the normal component when you're touching a surface, that surface can exert a force perpendicular away from it. That's the normal component. And if there's a component parallel to it, that's the friction component. Uh, but the normal force is an example of a, another force that adjusts itself to be what it needs to ensure um, some sort of equilibrium or static situation. You know, that's why I like to think of the normal, if you, you know, instead of normal force, I always call it the bathroom scale force. Right? It's whatever the bathroom, you know, if you were to slip a bathroom scale underneath, um, you know, the object touching the surface, the normal component is what the bathroom scale would read. And the example I always give is if you stand stationary on a bathroom scale, then your weight, your mass times little g, is being balanced by the normal component of the ground, you know, call it N if you want to call it the normal force. Uh, and so in that case, is the bathroom scale, which reads the normal force, uh, then reads back the value of mg, because they have to balance each other out. So if then I come and push down on your shoulders while you're standing on the bathroom scale, the bathroom scale reading goes up. Why? Because the surface has to push back not only against gravity, but against the fact that I'm pushing down on your shoulders. Um, in order to ensure that you don't sink into the floor or sink into the bathroom scale. Anyway, that's a review. So this is all, you know, moving towards the idea that of fields. We motivated this idea in the first lecture of thinking about how can two things that are not touching exert a force on one another? If I have a charge here, and then a charge here, and I then you know look a second later and see that they seem to be accelerating away from one another, they somehow let themselves be known to one another in 
they shared some sort of information that said, hey, we both are the same sign, both either positive or both negative. Let's get away from one another. How did that happen? Well, similarly, if we think back to gravity, when I release a ball near the, near the surface of the Earth, uh, and I look back a second later, I notice that it is accelerating towards the ground. Uh, particularly, it's accelerating with some sort of magnitude equal to 9.8, and it points downward. So I could define this thing called g as a vector, which is if up is positive, this would be no horizontal component, but negative 9.81 meters per second squared, so pointing down in the vertical direction. This is a vector that kind of quantifies the magnitude and direction of the acceleration experienced by that mass. So, so if I were to look at the gravitational force, I could then write it as the mass of the object times how it, you know, what it's feeling from gravity. So in this case, we could call this G the gravitational field. It has nothing to do with the object itself, right? It has nothing to do with the ball I've released. The G has every, only has to do with the Earth, uh, which then makes its presence known through this thing called the gravitational field. So if we were to draw this out, and we'll get some practice doing this. Right, essentially, if I were to plot G, it's not something I would plot only at one spot. But essentially, I would just plot a bunch of Equal, equal length arrows all pointing down. All right, this would be a, a plot of the field G, which in this case was no horizontal component, negative 9.81, excuse me for ignoring units, uh, in the vertical direction. That is a gravitational field, right? The kind of, the kind of presence of Earth um, kind of communicated Oof, that's not how these were communicated communicated through kind of space or at least the space near the surface of the earth because you know you get too far away from the surface it's not 9.81 and so then if you then have a ball that gets placed or released kind of within this field and it has a mass little m. The field then allows you to translate it into a force by taking the mass of the ball and multiplying it by this field. And then that becomes the force in this case. We will argue a similar thing with electrostatics. That if I have a charge Q here, it lets itself be known um, by kind of establishing this field, which the farther you get away from it, the weaker it gets. But it kind of always points, perhaps, radially away. All right, so that anywhere, if I were to pick any random spot in space, I could draw an arrow that corresponds to something that we will call the electric field. All right, so this is kind of the presence of this charge Q in space. Let's call it the electric field. It is a vector, right? And it's going to be defined such that if I were to then place another charge, you know, similar to what we did for gravity, right? We placed a ball with mass m. Since gravity acts on mass, right, then we could relate mass and gravity to a force. So then if I put some other charge here, right, say capital Q, we will be able to say something that the force kind of on capital Q from this lowercase Q 
then it's going to be equal to this capital Q times the electric field. This is the electric field from this lowercase q. And we'll be a little bit more careful with the signs of this stuff. There are some conventions that are, that are used. Um, I'm kind of doing this assuming that little q is positive. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about its proper definition there, but let's use this now as a motivation of thinking about vector fields, which we already saw a little bit in the course in the class sheets. And we'll, and we'll see it a little bit more probably on Monday. Um, and then use that to define this thing of how we can quantify this concept of an idea of a field, which must relate to this electrostatic force that we're getting better at, at doing. Um, but now we can actually get a little bit more physics-y and think about what is, there is something that little q is doing to all, to its surroundings to let its presence be known. We call that the electric field. We'll delve into that in the next video.